I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Sono New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus LeBron. This month, we're here in Low East Side, the neighborhood on Manhattan's Lower East Side got its Spanglish nickname from the Puerto Rican artist and activist, Bimbo Rivas, who wrote the poem, Loi Saida, I love you, I dig the way you talk. The community is one of the city's epicenters of Puerto Rican and Latino culture, the other being Harlem's El Barrio. Puerto Ricans began settling in the neighborhood in the late 40s and early 50s. Most were moderate to low income. The area experienced widespread divestment during the 1970s, when landlords walked away from their buildings and storefronts became drug fronts. Subsequently, Puerto Ricans were on the forefront of a movement that revitalized the community through art, culture, and politics. Places like the New Rican Poets Cafe and the many community gardens in the neighborhood now epitomize Loi Saida. On this episode, Loi Saida, where are you? Some longtime residents feel the neighborhood is suffering an identity crisis a delicate balance. A plan to shore up East River Park is not holding water with residents and activists. And Little Germany, the community that was way before Lois Saida. Those stories and more coming up as we explore Lois Saida. There's a grassroots movement afoot to raise awareness and possibly stop a city plan that could bury the East River Park under nearly 10 feet of dirt. This plan is part of something called the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. It's proposed to be the city's answer to the imminent threat of another Hurricane Sandy. However, critics and residents say the plan lacks vision and may do more harm than good. It's quiet today in the East River Park. The joggers and daydreamers go about as usual, past subtle reminders that this 57 and a half acre stretch of land that's become part of their every day is about to change forever. I think there was really a betrayal of the community and I think that is really one of the things that is hard to swallow because, you know, this new plan is really, um, it was just sort of, it feels like they want to just shove it down our throat. Christina Datz Romero is a Lower East Side resident and runs the Lower East Side Ecology Center. The center does everything from composting to running corporate team building programs in the park. The new plan she's referring to is a variation on something called the Big U. It was developed by the city's Department of Design and Construction and Rebuild by Design. The Department of Housing and Urban Development created Rebuild by Design in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. It was part of the federal government's effort to help the region deal with climate change. Amy Chester runs the nonprofit. The Big U um, was a vision from one of our design teams led by the Big Team. And the idea was to create multi-purpose infrastructure that would run around the U of Manhattan, essentially the floodplain, that could be tailor designed for the communities that were next to it. In the case of this community, it meant that a large structure would have been created alongside the FDR to make the park, and hence the neighborhood, less susceptible to the kind of flooding they saw during Hurricane Sandy. But the DDC changed the original $760 million plan in which the community had input at the 11th hour. The city came back with a new plan in September at a cost of an additional $700 million that will now raise the entire East River Park 8 to 10 feet. So the entire park now becomes the flood protection instead of just one area next to the FDR Drive. The Department of Design and Construction would not appear on camera to explain their decision about the project that will now cost $1.45 billion, but answered our inquiries via email. When asked why they decided to scrap the original plan, the response in part was as follows. The main reason why the plan was changed to the current Raise the Park design was construction feasibility, the ability to actually build the project on time. The original plan called for working adjacent to the FDR drive for four years. This means work could only take place overnight, and each night, time would have to be used closing one lane on the highway and then reopening it in the early morning. This would only leave several hours each night to do that actual work, and no flexibility at all to work longer hours if necessary to complete the project on time. 
However, that reasoning is not holding water with Dats Romero and other residents and activists. As I said, you know, when they uh, renovated this part here, it took them 10 years, right? Uh, and, you know, the city doesn't have a good track record in terms of delivering projects like that on time or on budget for that matter. So I have absolutely no illusions about it's, this project is at least five years, if not longer. But that's the least of the problems. Sandy was a wake-up call for New York, much as Katrina was to Louisiana and the rest of the country. Chester says that this is just a flashpoint in a bigger conversation about how cities like New York can be better prepared for the inevitable flooding that will come because of climate change. In many cities around the world, um, we're building floodable parks as a way of absorbing some of the water. But in our city, we're not yet doing that in some of the parks department land. Um, they are instead choosing to keep the water out. And I think a real reason is because of the maintenance issue. The parks department is not equipped, and they don't have a big enough budget to maintain these parks. So we need to start thinking about how we can create flood infrastructure that's also parks and give parks department both the responsibility and the budget to actually maintain it. Despite the criticism, the DDC says, quote, the new plan addresses the community's need for storm protection, providing it one hurricane season sooner than the original plan would have. In the meantime, Romero and other advocates are suggesting that a deck be built over the FDR that would extend from Montgomery Street in the south all the way to 25th Street in the north as a means of creating flood protection for the area as well as new park space that can be visited by nearby residents. She says that it's a matter of having the political will to get this done. Obviously, there needs to be a lot of planning to really accommodate for stuff, but I think the time is right to really think about uh, not timid steps, but you know, to be a little bit more bold about what it really, you know, why are we in this mess, right? Uh, we, you know, we can't engineer ourselves out of climate change, so what can we really do to, you know, have less impacts and you know, and build something that makes sense. Construction on the park is slated to begin by 2020. Before that, there will be a public hearing on the matter at the end of July. At one time, this neighborhood was simply known as part of the East Village then Alphabet City. But by the 1960s and 70s, the area had taken on a distinct flavor and a distinctive name. Judith Escalona took a walk through the neighborhood with a cultural activist whose father is a Low East legend, Bitman Bimbo Rivas. He was one of the original New Yorican poets and a community activist pushing for housing through sweat equity when others were pushing drugs. So I find it interesting that um, people that are the newcomers uh, approach you and they they ask you if you got permission to speak with this and that. I'm like, I was one of the groundbreakers with my father as a kid. We were the ones putting these plots down and we made this possible, you know, and then I have, uh, you know, I find it challenging when people don't know the history. My father and my son this community was burnt down. There were a lot of junkies in all the community. We had uh, vacant buildings. So people like my father, Bimbo, they went and helped to seal up these abandoned buildings and get um, other residents from the community involved. And they did the sweat equity program so that uh, the buildings could be occupied by families that were in actual need. And it was a very predominantly Puerto Rican community, but it was a ghetto. We weren't even on the map back in the 70s, you know, as part of the city. So this was like the neglected, they used to call it Alphabet City. But now we call this place Loisaida. There was a lot of theater, a lot of poetry, and these people that restored the buildings also were activists. They started grassroots organizations here like Charas El Boillo, Seven Loaves. There was mobilization for youth. There was El Teatro Ambulante. Many community organizations that began to help restore not only the 
community buildings, but also the lives of the people because they were the neglected few and they were poor and they didn't have an income or a direction. A job with all the benefits correlated with the sweat and time invested by myself. People like my father, Bitman Rivas, he started theater groups in the community. It, it inspired youth. It helped them to get off of sniffing glue, heroin, um, all, anything you could imagine was being dispersed through this community. Like there was no stopping it. It was a very big cancer. There was, I observed people on lines coming out of abandoned buildings waiting to get their drug supply. So it was really a very eye-opening childhood on what I wanted to do in life and what I didn't want to do in life. It's sad that he's not here right now. So Loisaida is a state of mind. That's always been there, that mural. And just walking through Loisaida, I see the transition that happened here. You know, it used to be a, a war zone. It looked like a war zone back in the day. Yeah, I see the revitalization. I see pe poor people with rich people living together in harmony. And it's beautiful, but there's an essence of Loisaida that was, has been lost. You know, we lost so many of our leaders in this community that it feels like a void. We used to have fish fries on every block and block parties and community events that would bring families together. And uh, that you don't see as often anymore. I feel like we've succeeded and failed at the same time. <laughs> That's what I feel. I feel that the people that were the core did not take ownership of the land, which is the true wealth. And that caused many people to be displaced in the gentrification process. I feel that even though I've managed to help people own, I'm sorry, wait, to own the, their property, I feel displaced. I don't feel that Luis Aida exists anymore. It's, it's a state of mind, you know, and I don't, there's nobody left here. It's like the village died. The Low East Side Center has been a community institution for the last 30 plus years. I sat down with the organization's director, Libertad Guerra, to talk about that history, the struggles they face, and plans for the future. Libertad, tell me when and why was the center created? The center was created in 78, uh, not necessarily the center, but the organization. And it was by a cadre of amazing cultural organizers and activists and community leaders. It was the tail end of a very creative era of grassroots activism. It was more of like this urge, also very creative in, in ethos, but uh, about sweat equity, the sweat equity movement, doing more with less. And so Loisaira comes in at the tail end of that in the late 70s with more of a vision of social services, but it just so happens that about a decade ago, uh, it became jeopardized, the organization, because the same building that we're in was about to be put up for redevelopment. So it took the local community to fight for it, and we've now claiming that we're here for the last five years. So you talked a little bit about sweat equity. One of the longtime residents and activists, Sandra Rivas, mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the fact that Loe Saida was losing a bit of its Puerto Rican personality. How do you respond to that? Well, it's not news anymore to say that uh, because that's what's happening to a lot of neighborhoods. But in the case of Loisaida, the Lower East Side, the East Village, however you want to call it, it was really the ground zero for, you know, this gentrification kind of uh, process. But oddly enough, because of 
what a lot of the activists and, and that spirit that happened in the 60s, 70s, this place still has a lot of enclaves that remain and that were rooted and that survive. It still has an amazing energy, vital energy, which is very multicultural. And not just, it's not only about culture, but it's diverse economic scales. You can still feel it. And, and I think that's the outcome of the, of the fights from the past, from mutual housing, community gardens, uh, community muralism. That's what equity movement that now have, you know, people are owners and they weren't displaced because they earned some rights. And so that's where you see the products mm -hmm. of, of those fights. You guys stage a massive festival along Avenue C. Would you consider that your signature event? It is definitely our signature and our most famous one. We've doubled it since Loisaida reopened in 2014. We doubled the attendance to 30,000 now people that, that attend, not just from New York, but the tri-state area. And some people even travel, so many, many people travel from Puerto Rico and, and other places. At the same time, it's also the platform, that, the visibility platform that we give to everything that happens year round in our center because we are not just a festival. We are a community center that is open year round. We have a lot of programs happening here from youth to elderly to artistic residencies to original exhibitions and productions. Part of where Loisaida is headed is opening a, a maker space and a production room for the community to have access to these technologies and this equipment. And we call it El Semillero or the seedbed. So Libertad, as the director of the Loisaida Center, what do you think the center's role is right now? The biggest role we have is to persist, to keep on keeping on, because we're filling the gap of something in, in, a, in a neighborhood that is distinctly part Puerto Rican, and we're the only kind of uh, institution from an era that still manages to be alive. So no matter how hard it gets, the lack of funding, capacities that sometimes nonprofits have to challenge is to keep on persisting. Libertad Guerra, thank you very much for joining us on Diversity Today. Thank you. Loved hosting you. Walking through Loa Isida, there's one thing you can't miss. There's a community garden on almost, if not every block. There's about 40 community gardens between avenues A and D, Houston and 14th Streets. Less obvious are the squats buildings owned by tenants who've taken them over from absentee landlords. This culture of unused space getting repurposed by locals is a major part of the history of Lois Saida. The Museum of Reclaimed Urban Spaces tells that story. This neighborhood always had a lot of activists. And I think these activists looked at spaces differently. And certainly years ago there was a problem. Uh, the city was in financial crisis. So there had been a lot of abandoned spaces. And then the activists reclaimed these spaces and made these wonderful community gardens and these buildings that are run by the, collectively run by the people. And those are called squats, which are still here today. And there was one law that's called adverse possession. That means if you take over a place for 10 years and no one really tries to fight you or makes a really big claim in court, that becomes yours. And I think that's how the squats kind of became legal. The museum is in a squat called Sea Squat. And this is kind of a punk famous musical squat. And once I found out this space became available, I was like, wow, to have an actual museum about the history of these gardens, the squats, the neighborhood, and have it in a real place. The squats are difficult to run. The gardens are even harder to run now because they're kind of run by the people, organized by the people, community, community gardens, but then the city kind of claims they own them. So there's this conflict about space. So the idea is like, what about the history? The history is the people started them. The history is the people did all the work. But now as time goes on, people are losing the history. And then the city is then saying, well, we own the gardens. No one ever did anything. We never tried to destroy them. So the idea of having this museum to show how did these things start? How did it all get going? We only have two small floors. So early on, we decided when we had the museum, let's not make it about people. 
because everything is about people. Let's not make it about art, because everything. We're going to make it about space. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. I was like, yeah, let's stick to that, because then no one's going to, and people still walk in the front door like, where's Armando Perez? He got murdered to save that community garden, you know, and he was here. And we're like, yeah, we know. We named a garden after him, but we can't have, if we have Armando, then we have to have this person, then we have to have that person, and then it's just a museum of people, right? So like, why don't we talk about groups, like people working together, maybe we might mention groups, but most of all we mentioned spaces. This building was originally a public school. And, and we've been able to do tours and school kids and have exhibits, and so the support has been amazing. On the other side of that, because we are in a squat, the support financially has been like nil. Like we don't even charge money to come in. In America, we have a constitution that says you have the right to assemble and the right to free speech. This is our biggest challenge, this idea that we can meet without a permit. And that's why these community gardens, the squats, and activism is so important. Finally, before part of the Lower East Side was named Lower East Side, it was called Klein Deutschland, or in English, Little Germany. People from the German Confederation emigrated to the U.S. from as early as the 1840s. The Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation conducts occasional tours of a number of important locations that were once part of the community. Our producer Bruno Giuliani spoke to the man who's keeping the area's Teutonic heritage alive. Klein Deutschland was the uh, third largest grouping of Germans in the world and they lived here between 14th and Division Street from the East River to about the Bowery and it was a place of tens of thousands of Germans that lived here and created a cultural community full of saloons and libraries and dispensaries and churches. From the 1820s onward there was uh, famine in Europe as well as political discord and especially uh, Bismarck and the Prussian Revolution of 1848 failed and that led to a greater uh, exodus of Germans to this neighborhood. Well, the German community was very well organized and they had their own newspaper. They had the first free library in New York City that's still there, the Ottendorf Library on 2nd Avenue. They created their own hospital dispensary, which is next to the library. It's the landmark on 2nd Avenue as well. And they created a very vibrant working rights culture fighting for greater wages, fighting for lower hours to work, and having uh, a multiple centers of community. Justice Schwab had a saloon at 50 East 1st Street. Uh, it was a, not just a, a, a bro bar, it was a place of ideas. It had a library, it had a performance space, and they had many gatherings for labor rights and other political rights. And it was a, a hotbed of creativity and thought uh, and help lead to uh, a greater expansion of the movement, the socialist and anarchist movements. Justice Schwab came to America in 1869. He was a Mason, like many after the Panic of 1873. He was unemployed. He organized with fellow workers and he became a labor activist and agitator. There was numerous marches to City Hall, numerous gatherings, but on that date in 1874, the police refused to allow the uh, gathering in Tompkins Square Park and they violently clubbed the organizers and the 10,000 people that were in attendance. After the melee, when the crowd had been beaten back, Justice Schwab walked through the crowd into the opening behind the police barricades and waved the red flag, and he was subsequently arrested for uh, attempt to riot. We thought to uh, recognize the uh, importance of Justice Schwab and his saloon and the activist history of the East Village and Lower East Side was a good way to set off our historic plaque initiative because of the importance to the labor history, to the cultural history, and to the history of the neighborhood in general as far as immigration and uh, uh, American politics goes. We are in front of the 6th Street Community Synagogue, but it was previously known as the St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church, and uh, many people from the German community would go here, and it is the uh, home church of the members of the congregation that perished on and during the General Slocum disaster of 1904. 
It was the 17th annual excursion, and they had um, contracted with the General Slocum vessel, named after the Civil War general and New York congressperson. And uh, in fact, because of lax standards of the day, the ship had previously had problems. It had run aground once coming from Rockaway, and uh, over a thousand people perished in the East River across from the Bronx when the boat caught fire and the hundreds of life vests did not work because of lack of safety protocols and the uh, emergency vessels were not seaworthy either. And so it was the largest single civilian disaster in America until the events of 9-11-2001 in New York City with the World Trade Center incident. The excursion was made up mostly of women and children. Um, and while it was way less than 5% of the overall population here, every family, every community, every building was touched by the tragedy. And in fact, uh, later on, there was very high incidence of suicide and people felt the need to just leave the neighborhood to try to forget this tragedy. That's our look at Loey Cider. Join us next month when we'll head up to the Bronx to Co-op City. Till then, walk outside and enjoy what's going on in our diverse city. <laughs>